For years, the game industry has looked to handhelds as a way to take our games wherever we want, whenever we want. Being tied down to a TV was a thing of the past when all of a sudden, we could play Tetris on our Game Boy, Mario on our Game Boy Color, and so on. As the years have gone by, the evolution of handhelds have only grown to be more technically advanced, and with Nintendo's latest hybrid console, the bridge of console quality games on the go feels truly the most realized it's ever been. Now Valve is looking to raise the bar with the Steam Deck. This is Valve's latest experimental piece of hardware that, like the Steam Controller and the Valve Index before it, is looking to shake up its new product category. The aim of the Steam Deck is to be able to take your Steam library on the go in a viable form factor that doesn't sacrifice power or price, making it one of the best value propositions for a handheld. You simply can't find a device at this $400 starting price that can output this type of game performance. Don't get me wrong, there are a few handheld PCs out there, but they're certainly not at the $400 price point with this level of performance and it's really only a company as large as Valve that can afford to subsidize the hardware to make this the most accessible way to take your Steam library on the go. The Steam Deck is one beefy handheld. When being placed alongside the current handhelds I own, none of them stand near the deck's size. While this device is meant to be portable, it's by no means pocketable. The Steam Deck comes in at 11.7 inches long, 4.6 inches tall, and just under 2 inches thick. Compared to the Nintendo Switch OLED, it's ever so slightly larger, but noticeably thicker. For reference, the Nintendo Switch OLED is 9.5 inches long, 4 inches tall, and 0.55 inches thick, and that's barely pocketable at times. In terms of build quality, the exterior housing of the deck is made out of plastic, and despite coming in at 1.5 pounds compared to the 0.93 pounds of the Switch OLED, somehow the deck feels ever so slightly more hollow to me. Perhaps it's because of its larger size and the ergonomics that feel like the Switch when it has the larger Horipod Joy-Con. It's not very pocketable, but in terms of a grip and how it feels to hold, it's fantastic. On top of the device, you'll find a power and weight button, a USB-C port for charging or hubs, a headphone jack, volume buttons, and an exhaust for the APU. The fan system does a great job at dissipating the heat from the handheld, and while it's not terribly loud, the higher pitch fan noise is noticeable. Luckily, the front-facing speakers of the device do a good job at drowning out the fan noise. At the bottom, you'll find a microSD card slot for expandable storage. Speaking of which, there are three different models of the Steam Deck coming in at $399, $529, and $649. This review is based on the $399 model since that's the most accessible one price point wise, but with a slower and smaller eMMC storage solution. Upgrading to the next model gets you a larger NVMe SSD at 256GB, and the highest tier gets you 512 with an anti-glare etched display. While the speed of the drives are mostly acceptable, I was surprised to find some more modern games like God of War taking up to a minute to load. On the front of the deck, you'll find a 7-inch 800p 60Hz LCD IPS display with two microphones hiding at the top. The display can reach up to 400 nits, it's great for playing indoors and even brighter than the current OLED switch. However, because this is an LCD display, the contrast and shadows are worse and appear less vibrant than that of the switch. To the left of the display are the left analog stick, a D-pad, and a select button. On the right side are the second analog stick, a pause button, and the four face buttons. Under both of the analog sticks are touchpads that work similarly to the touchpads on the Steam controller, along with some haptic feedback. The touchpad perfectly mimics the feeling of a trackpad, great for PC games that require a mouse. Next to those are the quick options menu above the right speaker, and the Steam overlay button over the left speaker. The last buttons are on the back where the grips are. You'll find four programmable buttons and their placement make them easily accessible while playing. There's also a second exhaust near the right side, further helping to keep the console cool. Powering the Steam Deck is a custom AMD APU consisting of a Zen 2 CPU ranging from 2.4GHz to 3.5GHz and an RDNA 2 GPU reaching up to 1.6 teraflops. There's also 16GB of RAM and 6GB of video RAM. All in all, it's a device at a price point with the performance you've just never really seen before. It outpowers the Nintendo Switch easily, and its closest competitors are priced at almost double the base price. Internally, you'll find all the basic wireless communication protocols like Bluetooth 5, Wi-Fi for 2.4, and 5GHz networks, but there's also a USB port at the top. If you have a USB-C dongle, you can also plug in a handful of USB accessories, another monitor, or even an Ethernet port. After all, the Steam Deck is basically a Linux computer at heart, so if it works with your desktop, it's most likely going to connect to your deck as long as you can with USB-C. Valve touts that the deck can last as long as 8 hours, and while it certainly can if you're playing an indie game like Celeste, you can expect most modern AAA games to last about an hour to an hour and a half. 
Luckily, SteamOS does give you an option to lock performance down to 30 FPS if you want to maintain a longer battery life. As I mentioned before, the Steam Deck is basically a portable Linux machine running SteamOS. If you've ever used Steam's Big Picture mode before, the experience is similar, though moved around to better cater to the deck's smaller display. It's a nice looking UI that easily gives you access to the system settings and the Steam overlay features like your friends list, messaging, notifications, and so on. Having this run on SteamOS also makes this one of the better launch lineups for the device. Not so much because they're tailor-made for the deck, but essentially you have access to your entire Steam library already. Using Proton, a compatibility layer, the deck is able to run some Windows games on Linux using a modified version of the Wine software. Basically, something that tries to translate Windows games for Linux. And for the most part, it does a great job. AMD and Valve have created a great little handheld that's optimized to take advantage of the hardware and the software to output some amazing performance. In my time playing with the Steam Deck for the last two weeks, I've played a handful of games as recent as this year and as old as decades ago. Naturally, I launched some of the Valve games I own like Portal 2, and as expected, it ran flawlessly. The experience was perfect and so slowly I made my way down the list tackling games that are both verified for deck and not. Elden Ring, for example, is able to run at 800p with about 30 to 45 frames per second performance when set on low settings. That's impressive to see something of this caliber and so recent of a game to run on a small handheld like this. Control Ultimate Edition, a game that famously struggled to run consistently on last gen base consoles, can hit 55 to 60 frames per second at 800p on low settings as well. To get anything remotely running like that on the go, I'd have to play the cloud version on my Switch, use xCloud, or even Stadia. Death Stranding was able to take advantage of the AMD Fidelity FX Super Resolution feature and run at high 720p at a solid 60 frames per second. Seeing these more intensive games that struggle to run on the Switch run flawlessly on the deck is such a night and day difference that really sets in stone how amazing this device is. So as you can see, there are a lot of great modern games that can perfectly run on the deck. At times even better than the consoles we were playing about two years ago. But it's not perfect. Booting up Sonic Generations, a game released on 360 and PS3 in 2011, can get 60 frames per second but drop as low as 25 frames per second, yet yeah, it has a verified badge on deck for some reason. Wolfenstein 2 on the other hand isn't verified for deck but runs great on my deck. So while having that on deck verified system is great, it doesn't really feel completely true at times and it feels like a Valve employee just booted up the game, made sure the controls on it worked, and slapped a seal of approval on it. And while at times this feels like it has the certainty of having a console and knowing that whatever is released on it just kind of works, these instances of really just being a Linux PC, something that isn't always going to work right, tends to pop up. That's sort of just the reality with this being a PC. Yes, it can run games you can't run on other devices in this form factor, but at the end of the day, it's a PC. That means you can install Spotify on this thing, get Discord up and running, hell you can even dock it and use it as a computer in desktop mode, with a full keyboard and mouse. Likewise, that also means that the games will just sometimes crash because the driver isn't working or some other program is messing with the game. You need to keep the computer awake to leave games downloading and so on and so forth. The trade-off is a lot more games available, it's open source so you can install a different OS on it, add emulators, and the online multiplayer is free. It's truly a tinkerer's heaven device that partially leans into trying to be a general consumer device. For example, when playing one game and trying to launch another, rather than just suspending one game and starting the other, SteamOS just warns you that performance is going to take because you're trying to launch two games at the same time. The Steam Deck is one fantastic handheld, but like with most first generation devices, especially when it's made by Valve and their history of hardware, it very much feels like a beta. Windows drivers are here already, but they don't feel completely tuned or ready for this device. If you're aiming to play games with easy anti-cheat or game pass, the Steam Deck struggles to get that up and running in a long-term usable form. However, unlike the Steam Link or the Steam Box initiative, I don't expect this to be abandoned anytime soon. Valve is showing a lot of promise with the deck, demonstrating how great Linux can be for gaming when paired with optimized hardware and software. When used as shipped, that means running SteamOS and using Proton to run your games, the Steam Deck runs mostly like a dream. Not every game is optimized for it, and even those that have the badge don't always feel like they were actually checked to run flawlessly on it. In that sense, there are growing pains, and because it is a PC, it's never going to be as tailor-made as an experience as something like a console and a storefront dedicated to that platform. It has its caveats, but you'll be hard-pressed to find a device of this quality and performance at this price. Yes, I wish the screen was as vibrant as the Switch and that it had better rumble and that the bezels weren't so big, yet it feels so hard to complain about anything at this value proposition that, as I mentioned before, is constantly being updated and for the better. If you have the money to spend, the Steam Deck is a fun product to own, tinker with, and play with. 
But if you're more conservative with your money and want something that you just know is going to work, I say go get a console or a handheld or just wait out a few months. Valve has already said this is going to be a generational device, so you can more than expect the second model down the line.